Joach Maggi. Uh, he has been working in the world of drinks and gastronomy for more than 20 years. He was my teacher <laughs> as well for cocktails and spirits. Um, uh, all, always with wines and spirits in South, uh, in South America. He has led the opening of uh, a dozen of uh, gastronomic establishments and he uh, worked in marketing for prestigious companies as um, Moe Genesi, uh, Viviton and Diageo, uh, collaborating in the construction of luxury brands uh, for various, for uh, many countries. Uh, he has a strong strategic vision that draws from his studies uh, because he studies sommelierie and he studies psychology and coaching. Uh, so uh, team building, leadership, uh, branding and strategic uh, communication are his main strengths. And he is a, uh, a great professional from, from Argentina now living outside. Um, the, um, uh, Oradora uh, de la Noche de Lujo, uh, Julie Dupuy, and from the, she comes from the southwest of France, and Julie started her wine journey as a trainee in Somalia in 2002, and since then uh, she never stopped. Uh, after several competitions, she reached uh, the third position in Argentina in 2016 in the best sommelier of the world. Uh, having finished uh, competing internationally in 2019, uh, she turned her focus towards Som Ninja, uh, that I suggest to everybody, which is great. Uh, and it's a mobile application which is dedicated to wine study students and sommeliers, preparing for formal competitions and, and qualifications. Um, she has uh, um, the WCT uh, level three in sake, uh, also a certification in tea uh, with the London Tea Academy, uh, as well as also um, the, the course of, of beers uh, from London as well, uh, Beer and, C and Cider Academy in London. Uh, in 2019, she won the Champagne Academy Trophy and the Cava Academy First Prize. Uh, actually, she runs uh, as well as uh, some ninja, she runs a, a some consultancy uh, business that is called Down to Wine, and and get to train people in the trade. Uh, she hosts trainings and events. Uh, she judge uh, at wine competitions and many many other things. Uh, she is the president of the Irish uh, Guild of Sommeliers and deputy secretary uh, general of the uh, ASI. As, as I. Um, so I will uh, leave you with um, uh, with uh, Sebastian and and Julie uh, for this great talk uh, about cognac and it's our first masterclass about spirits. So enjoy everybody and hope to see you very soon. Thank you. Thank you, Paz. Thank you for thank you, Paz. The, thank you for the introduction. Um, it's a great pleasure for me to be together with all you all. Um, well, let's leave space for Julie to has a beautiful presentation to share with us together today. So uh, any questions you have, you, we can, we, we will be attending them one, one after the other one. Okay. Um, and to, for me, maybe a, a good question, I think to start with is, uh, Talking about the profession, talking about some, as a sommelier, you know? how how spirit world, how cognac in particularly, uh, you you find a, a path over there. How which were your opportunities? How can you encourage the rest of, of the audience over here to to think about spirits in in, in the way that being useful for you? That's my Thank question. Thank you very much, Sebastian, for the question. Yes, well, it's, it's a funny thing because spirits uh, is, is a big thing as a sommelier. I mean, I always loved spirits personally, um, but I, I do think that um, sommelier should like spirits and the more you will uh, get to taste them and to understand them and the more you should get to really enjoy them. It can be a bit challenging, obviously, at, at start because it's 40% alcohol in general and not, you know, 
13 percent like wine or, or, or rand so obviously it's more challenging on the taste buds but you can learn how to taste it with a bit of, of water and so on but i think there is a there is a com complexity in spirit in some of aromatics there is a, a magic in in the world of spirit that is really you know uh, appealing and exciting and, and there is space there and I know sometimes it's more difficult at the summit to sell spirits because especially cognac, people think, oh, cognac is maybe an older person drink, maybe a man drink and, and so on. But I think there is space for cognac. There is a, there has a, you know, there's been a revival of whiskey. There's been a revival of jeans. Uh, we hear more and more about shoshu from Japan. Uh, there are more and more things happening with, with, with spirits. And I think cognac didn't get that chance just yet. Um, and maybe we need to adapt in the way how we serve it and we need to ask somebody uh, to help put forward spirits in general um, through pairings first of all uh, through building interesting spirit lists um, with or without obviously the, the the help of a of a mixologist or bartender depending where we are working um, and we need to learn how to serve them uh, properly in proper glassware and at the right temperature because I think this this was make as well a very big difference when it comes to really enjoying um, spirits in general. So we've lots of work to do as somebody to make them the the star of the show as as well as wine <laughs> on wine on list. Okay, okay, and I will, I believe you have a presentation to share with okay, us. So I'm going to share maybe a last question related to yes. this. Yes. Um, as a sommelier, I, am, I I know that you have been involved in many competitions and, and you are you you have trained hard about this what what um suggestion or what uh, can you give us all uh, related to how to prepare or how to train yourself in in, the, in terms of spirits of course yes so there are two different aspects i would say to this and it is you know i suppose this the first recommendation i'm going to make is also the same as for wine or for any other beverages, I think you need to understand the theory be behind the product to be able to uh, be able to learn how to blind taste the product. If you were in a competition, for example, you need to understand that, you know, the rum is made from sugar cane. How does it, you know, how does it taste like? How does it smell like? You need to know that cognac is made from grapes. You need, I think you need to have some really and a good understanding of the product before you can move on to the tasting of the product. Because if you don't understand it, how can you find out what it is in a, in a glass? Then once you reach the point where you understand the product, I think it's important to train yourself, not only in tasting, knowing what they are, but tasting blind. Okay, so, and also to taste in black glasses. I think tasting in black glasses is very important to manage to focus more on the aromatic uh, perception of the spirits more so than also thinking about the color uh, and i think black glasses are very important as part of a training when especially for, for competitions or certifications to make uh, to make your tasting more and more accurate don't know if if, uh, if you agree with this sebastian yes um, i do but if you if, let's start with the presentation if you think so Yes, absolutely. So we're going to talk about cognac. Uh, of course, I will, I will try to, to speak as clearly as I can. I wish I could do the presentation in Spanish. I'm sorry, I can't, uh, I can't do that. So of course, feel free to ask any questions um, and I can re try to re-explain or repeat things if, if, if it's not clear. So we're going to talk about cognac um, for, the, for the night, <laughs> for the evening. But before we talk about this, so we're going to see, okay, what is cognac? So before I move on to like, what is, is cognac as a, you know, as the detail of the spirit itself, um, let's look at, you know, what's the difference between a cognac a spirit and, I don't know, um, how, how, do, how does this is made? So um, unlike wine or beer, cognac is, is fermented to start with because you need some grapes, okay? Cognac is a, a spirit based on, on grapes. So you need grapes to be able to produce cognac. You need first to have a fermentation of those grapes, which are going to be turned into wine, and then the wine is distilled. So just to go through briefly about the, the principle of, of distillation, to have, um, to create a spirit, you need to distill. And what is distillation? It's the separation of two liquids, uh, which one is in fact the water, which is contained in the wine, because water is going to contain 
to compose at least 80% of, of the wine, a minimum 80% of the wine, which is going to be used to produce cognac. And within that wine, you have other components. One of it is ethanol, alcohol. And to, when you boil water, you boil water at 100 degrees Celsius before it starts evaporating. But ethanol has a much lower boiling point. In fact, ethanol boils at around 78% degrees and it starts evaporating and creating fumes. So when you distill um, anything, but like in this case wine, you're going to separate the ethanol and other of the other components from the water. And then it's going to create some vapors and you're going to condense it again to extract the liquid, the, the, the spirits in some way, the, the mind of, of the wine. So that's really the, the kind of the basics of, of distillation, but we'll go into that a little more um, into details. So now what is cognac? So cognac is a French spirit. So cognac is a protected um, appellation, it's a protected um, beverage. It cannot be produced outside of France and it cannot be produced outside a certain area in France. And I'll show you the map a little bit later on. Cognac has a long history. Um, so Cognac is also a city, it's also a city within the area, so the, the, the village or the city of Cognac. And it is a city which has a long history for winemaking, but also for storing uh, salt. So originally in the 11th century, uh, Cognac was very famous for the, for the storage of the salt, which was produced in the Atlantic Ocean, and then um, for their wines. And people from Holland used to come by boat through the sea to collect salt and to collect wine. However, because the transport was so long, um, very often the wine, when arriving in uh, the Netherlands or, or Holland, uh, turned out to be sour, turned out to have oxidized, turned out to be faulty. So it took them a little bit of time to think about it, but eventually, four centuries later, in the 15th century, Dutch people realized that if they distilled that wine, they were managing to transport it in better condition. And that's when the distillation in cognac started um, in, in the 15th century. So distillation, uh, they used to call it uh, the products that en they ended up with, which was a very high strength alcohol. It was over 40% alcohol at the time. At the time. Um, they used to call it Brandwein, which is a direct translation for burnt wine, uh, which because they used to burn the wine to distillate and then to ship it to, to, uh, to Holland. And that's where the, the word brandy, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the word brandy, uh, came from. So from the word brandy, or brandy, I'm not sure how you pronounce it in Dutch, uh, but that's, that's actually where the word comes from. And brandy in the English speaking word uh, is used for two different things. Originally it was cognac only, and nowadays often it's a global term which is used for spirits made from grapes. So Armagnac, Cognac, uh, Brandy from Rejes are called Brandy, which became a general term. So sometimes it's a bit confusing when you're dealing with English speaking people to know if they actually want a Cognac or if they want something else than a Cognac when they mention Brandy. So that's where the story of, of Cognac uh, started. So I move on to the other, the other page. So as you can see here, so you have, uh, I don't know if you can see my cursor moving, but if you can in the top, right corner of that map you have france okay uh, you have bordeaux uh, here with my cursor here and if we zoom in we are in the terroir of cognac we're in the area of cognac so today uh, there are around 78,000 of uh, hectares of vines planted in cognac um, it's good to know that years ago um, in the in the 19th century at the beginning of the 19th century before the phylloxera attacked the region of Cognac, there was, um, there was over 200,000 hectares, I think, planted around uh, of grapes in Cognac. It was 280,000, I think, great, thousand hectares planted. And then the, ph the phylloxera attacked the region of Cognac, like, you know, the rest, obviously, of France and, and then Europe and the world. And only around 40,000 hectares of vines ended up being planted in cognac. And little bit by little bit, people started crafting the vines with American rootstock and redeveloped the vineyard. And, around, and today you have around 78,000, 80,000 hectares of vines. So it has a long history from the 15th century as a distillate, uh, as a, as a distillate, as a distilled drink. But the delimitation of the region that you can see on the map 
was officialized in 1909. So if you can look at, if you look at the map, you see different colors, and those are the different subregions, the official subregions within the region of Cognac. So in dark green, just south of the city of Cognac, you have what is called Grande Champagne. And in red, you have got what is called Petite Champagne, and they are considered the heart of Cognac. Now, the word Champagne is confusing because the word Champagne is also used for the production of sparkling wines in the region of Champagne in France. It has nothing to do with sparkling wines. It actually comes from um, a Latin word uh, that was campus, which means field. And uh, it's because they are in the heart, in the land, in the field, in the center of the region, that apparently it is called, uh, cam it, it came from campus and it's called Champagne. But that's the name of the region, but it has nothing to do with the sparkling wines. Those two regions here, lots of people will tell you that they are, are the best area for the production of grapes to make cognac. Now, I would say yes and no. Obviously, the terroir, the soil is different. You have a lot of chalk, a lot of limestone, and some clay in these parts of, of cognac, uh, which are going to produce some, uh, some spirits, which are going to need more time to age, uh, which can be incredibly elegant. Uh, which tend to be quite lean and slender uh, as a style, not opulent uh, spirits. But however, it's also all down to the grapes. So you can produce bad grapes from fantastic terroir, but you can also produce good grape from, you know, less good terroir. So it's also down to the quality of the grapes. But those two regions are considered, are meant to be some of the best in the area. Then in light green, north of Cognac, you have what is called Bordeaux. And Borderie um, are slightly more, a little more sand, um, also some limestone and a little more clay. The soil is a little bit richer and it tends to give some eau de vie, some spirits, which are a little more round in texture, which can be a little more voluptuous and also more aromatic. People talk often about the Borderie as an area which gives some cognacs that smell and taste like violet flowers. That's like the, the characteristic the main characteristic of those of those areas. Then um, in the yellow, uh, in yellow, you've got what is called Fimbois. So in Fimbois, you also you have a mix of, of soil depending where you have. You have some clay, you have some red clay, you've got quite a lot, it can be quite stony. Um, you have you can find a bit of flint as well in some areas. You've got some chalk, uh, not chalk, but limestone. Um, so it's, it's a very big area, as you can see. The spirits which are in this area, which are produced from this area, are usually more fruit forward. Um, they are aging quicker, so they are readier to drink earlier. And then you also have, again, you know, the closer you go to the, to the coast, obviously inland there, you're further from the coast, but the closer you go to the coast, the more sand you are going to find in your Konak. So you've got Bonbois, and you also have another area called Bois à terroir, which can also be called Bois ordinaire. So on, on the presentation here, I, I wrote down Bois ordinaire, but you can also call them Bois à terroir. And you have an island here, uh, which is the island of La Rochelle, uh, not La Rochelle, of Ile de Ré, sorry, which can also produce uh, some grapes to make cognac. What I find often in the, in the spirits which was produced uh, near the sea, they can have a very salty character and they can taste a bit like iodine, like they have a, a marine um, salinity in them. So they might not have the opulence of fruit and the complexity of the cognac, which are produced you know, in Petit Champagne, Borderie or Grand Champagne, but they can be some in incredibly interesting and, and delicious spirits also produced in those areas. So that's kind of the main lines of what makes the differences between the different subregions. So the, the area was first delimited in 1909. Then the Appellation d'Origine Contrôlée, which is um, the, the text, the law of the text law, the textbook that said, okay, this is not protected. We're going to make cognac that way using those grapes and so on and so on, was officialized in 1936. And then all of those subregions were only delimited in 1938. So it was a few years later. Mm. So the grape varieties in, in, in cognac. Currently, the main grape variety which is planted, which is 98% of the vineyards, about, is called Unublanc. In Italy, it is called Trebbiano. 
Um, it is a grape which originally, before the, phylo the phylloxera, was not the most planted. In fact, it was sharing the vineyard with Folle Blanche. But nowadays, um, after the, the phylloxera, when people had to graft uh, the vines on American rootstock, they realized that Uniblanc was more resistant um, to gray rot, especially. So it's an area in, in France where you have a lot of rain. Uh, you have the Atlantic Ocean to the west, and it's, you know, it's an Atlantic climate, lots of rain. Lovely weather in the summer, but still a lot of humidity. So you need some grapes which are going to be, would need to be resistant to, to rot, mildew, and so on. And Uniblanc is a very resistant grape variety. On the opposite, Folle Blanche is not. And that's why Uniblanc was, uh, was selected as uh, the main grape variety, one of the reasons. The other reason as well is people realized originally that you could produce a lot of wines out of, um, out of Uniblanc. So at some point in the history of Cognac, I think you could have produced 120, 130 hectoliters of wine per hectare. So they were really, you know, making a lot of wines per hectare out of those vines. Uniblanc is also a grape. Um, that it, it, it is at the limit there where it can grow really in terms of climate. So it is going to produce some wines which are not going to be very high in sugar, producing some wines which are going to be relatively low in alcohol. And we'll talk about this after, but this is important for the production of cognac. And it's also a grape variety which is naturally very high in acidity, especially in this part of the world which means that the wine um, is going to be very resistant, resistant to spoilage, oxidation, and, and so on, and also bacteria and, and all of this, because it's absolutely forbidden to use any um, uh, sulfur dioxide uh, for the production of cognac. So the grapes need to manage to be, um, the wine needs to manage to protect itself. Uh, and that's why Uniblanc is, is a very good grapes for this, thanks to its high acidity. Julie? Yes. We are talking about the varieties you were talking about recently. Oh, I, I, yes, sorry, I, I didn't talk there. All the grape varieties which are permitted. So you have Colombard. Uh, Colombard that is uh, used as well in Vintpelli to produce uh, some very fruit forward, um, aromatic style of wine in the southwest of France. So you have Folle Blanche. Folle Blanche, you find more Folle Blanche in Armagnac than in Cognac. And the other grapes, you have Montils, um, which to be honest with you, I've never tasted. Folignan, I think in terms of the blend, you allowed maximum 10% if you're going to use it in the blend. Again, a grape that I'm not very familiar with because they are very rare. And then you have Semillon, which is a grape which is more often used for the production of white wine, especially sweet wines in the region of Bordeaux, in the region of Sauterne, Barsac, Ceron, and so on, uh, which is a grape which is very prone uh, to uh, to rot because in fact it's prone to noble rot in general in the right condition so again used in very small quantity so it is going you, you can sometimes see single grape variety mentioned on bottles of cognac which are not going to be any blanc but it's very rare most of the time it's going to be whether any blanc or perhaps mostly any blanc with a blend of other grape varieties okay. and it in the case that the, the ocean and the, the sea uh, mm. in, influence in in this uh, in Bordeaux, in Bo 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 Bordeaux, um, in this place, has to do with the aging or has to do with the with the variety itself. I mean, the wine itself. At the end of the day, why why is the influence the influence of the iodine? And you talk about oh yes, yeah, sure. So so, I, you know, I don't have an official answer for this, but I actually find that very commonly, not just in cognac, but I actually find that in all the vineyards which are close to the ocean, anywhere around the world, I would imagine with the wind from the sea, you would have some, in some way, some deposit coming from the seawater in the vineyards. And I find that some, some ones in the world are actually very salty um, when they are close to the ocean. And I would imagine that the saltiness would come from the grapes which have been produced not too far from, uh, from the ocean. I would imagine it is this. I don't have any evidence to prove it. It's just, you know, what I can deduct, mm -hmm. but I don't have any scientific evidence to, you know, to back that up. Okay. And last question, talking about varieties, uh, to a certain extent, Generally, the comparison between cognac and Armagnac is always there. No, we, we always 
see together these two brandy styles of spirits, no? Uh, you talked about, we know that there are some other differences, like the, uh, the, the distillation and, and mm -hmm. the latitude and many others, but uh, talking about the grape, you believe that the grape has something to do over there? The I mean, grapes, yeah, so the grape can make definitely a difference in terms of, of texture, of aromatic expression. You can definitely have uh, the grapes. The terroir is going to make a big difference. And um, I suppose for me, when it comes to blind tasting, if you were to be given a Armagnac and a Cognac, very often how I managed to, to differentiate them when I got it right, which was not all the always the time, was actually the seasoning of the oak. I find that the seasoning of the oak in cognac and in armagnac is very different. Sometimes people say armagnac can be a bit drier or it can be more rustic, but it is not, it's absolutely not true. I mean, it can be true, uh, but you find out some examples of cognacs which are incredibly refined, which are rounded, which are smooth, which you could actually think are cognac. And when it comes down to this, for me, it's down to really paying attention to the taste of the oak in the spirit. Um, for me, that's what helps really giving it away between, uh, between the spirits. But yes, you can also have some single vintage in Armagnac, which are allowed in Cognac, but which are not really commonly seen. And I suppose because if you're going to produce a single vintage from a spirit, you're going to have more challenge to make it probably more balance harmonious because you're just dealing with whatever you've 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 selected on that year and, and that's it except if you have access to different eau de vie from the same vintage uh, when if you're going to blend different vintages you can you know work around and create the balance you want so perhaps as well the fact that of, very often you find a lot of single vintage armagnac this could have an impact as well on 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 the end taste end taste the fact of not necessarily always blending vintages and a question I, I take from the audience, yeah? So I encourage to be, have more questions from the audience here. Um, it's about, you, you told us that 90% more or less is it's all about Uni Blanc, no? And Cognac. But is there any restriction or it has to do more with the practice that the varieties you will find maybe more for uh, Colombard in some area than Uni Blanc or it's also no, so, the, oh, sorry, there the, the are no restrictions. The only one which has a restriction, I think, is Folignan, which can only be 10%, whatever happened, maximum. Um, you even had, until 2020, you had a couple of other grape varieties. I think there was Mélier Saint-Francois, and I don't remember the other one, which, if they had been planted before, I think, 1995, uh, you could still use them until 2020. Uh, in the production of cognac. So technically they could be in there in all the cognac. There is no restrictions. It's really down to what people have. You see the market in, in cognac, we'll talk about that a little later, but it's dominated by four main company brands, which, which are buying grapes or spirits from other producers to mature them and blend them themselves. So I would imagine that the only way to actually taste all the grape varieties and um, really Uniblan, who be to manage to find the producers which are growing their grapes, making their own spirits, and making you know and really trying to express those grape varieties through uh, through cognac. Um, I would say that is the only way, but it, it it is no there is no there is no legislation. You just do whatever you want, and obviously you need to make a living out of it at the end. So you have to make choices uh, from that. <laughs> Okay, thank you. You're very welcome. So if we look at um, the grape processing, you can see that um, I've put down a picture with a harvesting machine because this is the norm. It's not compulsory, but a lot of the harvesting cognac are going to happen with the machine harvesting. The reason for this is because the grapes need to be processed as quickly as possible. They arrive in the, in the wineries, they are crushed, they are pressed, and uh, then they are going to be fermented. Because SO2, uh, di sulfide dioxide, is not permitted uh, for the production of cognac, the grapes have to be handled very quickly from vineyard to winery. And very often, often you know, in the summer or at the end of the summer, in, in, 
September or so on, when the harvests are happening, can be very warm as well. So with the machine, you can harvest later at night, early in the morning, at times when it is actually cooler to, um, to reduce the risk of oxidation. So machine harvesting, I doesn't mean that some people, maybe small producer, do it by hand. I would imagine because machine harvesting is, is expensive. Or it probably can rent it. But I mean, if it's a small property doing their own thing, they, they probably do it by hand. But the most major, the majority is going to be by machine. Chaptalization is not permitted. So no addition of, of any sugar to increase the alcohol content and no SO2 is being used. It's also the norm to use cultured yeast. We often talk in the wine world or cult cultured yeast. There is this big thing at the moment of people don't like talking about cultured yeast. People like hearing about native yeast, wild yeast, and so on. Where in cognac, very often it's going to be cultured yeast uh, because the wine has to be fermented very quickly. Uh, it has to have you know, certain specific uh, aromas in the wine to make sure that it's not going to create some unpleasant aromas and flavors once it's distilled so it has to be very controlled and and very predictable the ones uh, as I, I mentioned earlier on especially nibla is going to give some wines which are going to be uh, quite low in alcohol so between nine and ten uh, percent in average maximum in fact i think it has to be between seven and twelve percent by low but in average it's going to reach around nine to ten percent alcohol so low alcohol and high acidity Malolactic fermentation, it's not compulsory, but it's common practice to do it. There is enough natural acidity. Uh, lactic acid, uh, malic acid is going to be uh, transformed into lactic acid, which is going to be more stable than uh, malic acid. So, you know, this is kind of normal uh, wine making process, but with no SO2. Then you reach a point where the wine is going to be stab stabilized. Uh, the gross leaves, the bigger leaves are going to be removed, but there is a choice there that can be made, be made before stirring the wine, which is, do we keep the leaves, the fine leaves, or do we remove them? Do we filter them out? They out? And this is going to be important because the leaves are going to have an impact on how the, text, how the cognac is going to taste and the texture of the cognac as a, as a finished uh, product. So that's, that's a decision that can be made can be fully removed, can be fully leave, left, or it can be partially removed. Um, so it's, it's a kind of a decision which is made there based on the style of cognac that needs to be, or wants to be produced. Then the wine is going to be stored in inert vessels, generally stainless steel, and it must be distilled at latest the 31st of March following the harvest. So that's the let, latest date when the cognac can be uh, distilled or the wine can be distilled. Do we have enough, maybe perhaps question before I move on to the next slide? Maybe up to here because um, in your experience uh, in the trade, in the, in the difference between brands, uh, you talked about up to now two, two features that could make difference or uh, mm. that, are, that um, one of the producers can talk about. One is the the difference between the lease, yeah, the keeping of a storage, and the other one is the variety. Maybe in some cases there are some examples of uh, producers that talked about this. Not it's not so common. It's more uh, about all of blank. Is there something else you can highlight from this stage up to this stage up to here? Not talking about the um, distillation and, and and the rest of the process. I'm to, I mean up to here. Maybe organic. Maybe well, organic, organic. To be honest, I don't know the percentage of organic producers in cognac, but I'm afraid it must be very, very low. Um, I rarely heard about cognac, I mean, grapes being grown. It's a very tam climate. Um, I'm afraid I, I don't, I don't. I, do, do you actually, have you, come, have you come across an organic cognac before? No, I, I no. didn't, but the question maybe. I, have, I haven't either. I wish I, wish I could say I had. But I haven't, um, and this is definitely a very good question. <laughs> but no, um, this is not a region in France at the moment, I think, which with the climate they have, which I think they managed to, well, saying this, they managed to do it in, 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 you know, in Muscadet and so on. So maybe they have no excuse not to do it in, in Charente. But at the moment, I've heard very, very little about organic viticulture in, in, in the region of Cognac, unfortunately. 
Okay, thank you. So the use of fine needs or not, so just to develop a little bit around this. So um, what are the fine needs bringing? If you keep them in the wine that you are going to, to, to distill, you are going to have more byproducts, which are going to be produced during the distillation. So you've got what is called fusel alcohol. They're quite, it's another type of alcohol which is produced, which have a very heavy and oily texture. So this is you can be uh, bringing you know different flavors, but also different texture. You can have you can bring fatty acids, amino acids, and that's why when you have a cognac which is distilled with its lees, they tend to be rounder, richer, creamier in texture. In terms of aromatic impact. Uh, because um, when you distilled, with the distillation of cognac, which we're going to see afterwards, it's usually now the, the steel is heated up with, uh, with gas. Now it's a direct uh, heat applied usually with gas. In the past, it was with you know, wooden oven or, or, or so on underneath. But because the leaves are going to sit at the bottom of, of the vessel, which is containing the wine, which is being boiled, um, you have what is called the Maillard reaction that happens, which is like a, a caramelization that also happens in cooking. So this is going to produce uh, different flavors, different types of flavors and brings more complexity and richness. It's not going to be fruity. It's going to be probably more, you know, umami, savory, uh, like a earthy kind of flavors. It can be quite uh, buttery as well or, or milky in terms of flavors as well. And uh, they, they offer great potential for esterification, which means during the maturation, so once the cognac is in cask aging, you have uh, more aromatic complexity developing uh, because of the presence of those leaves. If you remove the leaves, on the other hand, you tend to obtain some cognac, which are going to be very pure, very food forward, and which won't necessarily have the creamy texture that you're going to find with cognac with, with leaves. So there are kind of two main schools of, like mainline schools of, of, of making cognac. You've got what is called uh, the Martel method, um, which uh, the, the fine leaves are completely removed with Martel. And I put down that uh, there, the seconds, I will, I, it's, a, it's a hard one because we, we haven't talked about distillation. I will, I'll go back to that because I need to talk about distillation later, but let's remember that for Martel, they always remove their leaves. On the other hand, for Rémi Martin, uh, they always keep uh, the fine leaves for, uh, for the production of their cognac, which is going to give a richer style. If you taste Rémi Martin XO or the SOP, for instance, it's true that the style is generous, it's rounded, um, it's, it's, it's a beautiful, rich style that, that they produce compared to Martel, for example. Do you have any advice about this? I mean, any consideration of the style in, in terms? Of uh, I think it's really down to personal preferences. Uh, personally, I do like the presence of the leaves inside. Uh, I, I like cognac, which are, which have, I, it's not that I choose my cognac, but often when I actually did some blind tastings and then looked at how the cognac was made, I realized that I tend to go often for cognac, which have been made with the fine leaves in, in the wine, more so than uh, the other method. But it doesn't mean that I never came across a cognac which had been distilled without the leaves that I, you know, I didn't like. So I think it's really dependent of, of obviously at the end, end result, what also the, the harmony and the balance that the house has managed to reach, or the producer has managed to reach through blending. Because in some cases, when you blend cognac, you, you use spirits which have been distilled, different age, often age in different type of oak and different cellars and so on. Some of them might have been distilled with the leaves, some of them might have been distilled without the leaves. So then when you blend, you can find the balance. So it's, you know, even though the distillation might happen with or without, at the end, you can still have the option to blend with spirits which were made in different ways. So it's down to the, down to the house, down to the producer. Okay. So the cognac distillation, um, actually I took that picture in Hennessy, <laughs> one of the distillery of Hennessy a few years ago. 
uh, that's I, I don't think they're using this anymore. I think it's more like a, a like somewhere where you can go and, and visit and see how it looks. Um, so cognac, the, tip, the, the difference between cognac and Armagnac, the main difference is cognac has to be distilled twice in a Charente pot still. Armagnac most of the time is distilled once, but by law can be distilled twice. When in Armagnac there is no choice, it's going to be distilled twice. The maximum strength for the distillation of both cognac and armagnac, in fact, is 72.4% alcohol. So obviously this is going to be reduced through maturation and through addition of distilled water in the final stage of production. Um, but the maximum strength that it can reach, coming out, leaving that still, it's going to be 72.4%. There are two distillation, and we'll, I'll go more into the distillation in the next slide, but it's good to try to remember the, the, the term, the terminology of those distillations. So the first distillation, which is when you're going to take the wine, the low alcohol white wine, and distill it the first time, whatever you're going to have on the end of your still, is going to call, uh, or the, this first process is called the premier shove, the first shove, the first heat, shove is heat. And the second one is called the bonne shove, which is called the good heat. Bogwan is good and shelf is heat related to temperature. There are some, I put, I put a lot of details here. Some of you might be studying, I don't know, for advanced court of master somebody or so on, you will need to need those details. For those of you who already started, you don't need to remember the size, the capacity of the still, but they are there if you want. So by law for the first distillation, um, the still has a capacity of maximum 140 hectolitres, but can only be filled up to 120. And then the second still is much smaller. Uh, it is maximum 30 hectolitres, and the capacity of that still filled is maximum, I mean, only filled up to 25 hectolitres per hectare. And it takes an average of 9 litres of wine to produce 1 litre of eau de vie. So the eau de vie is the spirit, the clear spirit, that um, is the end product that is collected after the second distillation. So you can see there, uh, I have a better, um, a better picture on the other one, a better diagram of that, um, of that. but there you can see there is direct hill at the bottom. Uh, the wine is going to be uh, staining, it depends of, of actually of, of, the, of the pot, but technically there should be a vessel here where the wine is, is sitting. With the heat, the direct hill is going to boil, it's going to vaporize, it's going to go through uh, the swan neck. Sometimes you can have also uh, wine here, the, the, the hot uh, vaporized alcohol going through this, not in contact, but you might have a pipe going through, is going to preheat some more of the wine that can be then distributed back into here. And then once it reaches here, you've got generally some cool water or it's, it's cool, so it condenses again, turn back into liquid and is being um, it's called, it's been condensed and it's being collected uh, on the other end as a spirit, but it doesn't reach 72% just yet on the first distillation. So we're going to, to look at this now. I took the diagram from the WSCT book, which is very good. Uh, if, I, if any of you are, uh, you don't have to do actually the course of WSCT, you can buy the book. It's uh, the, la the last book on spirits. They have a if they have a course dedicated spirit. It's, I don't know the course, but the book is excellent. So that's, I took actually that picture. I thought it was very good from uh, from that book, so I have to credit that to them. So the premier shove, the first hit, what happens is you have uh, the charging vessel here, so you've got the wine in here. Julie? You have, yes? Sorry, sorry, before going to the core of your presentation, because this is one of the things that you mentioned previously, yeah? Um, is there any, we have two simple questions of your, of your slide before, your, your previous slide. Oh, yes, um, yes. The, the prefermenter, is just a functional uh, a gadget, no? It has nothing to do with the style, with the ending style of the product, yeah? Uh, the, this year or? Yeah, the prefermenter, the preheater, pre I'm sorry. Pre the preheater, just yes. so for it's, a functional gadget. Yes, yeah, so it's, it's not even on all, to, on all still. Some still don't have it. Uh, certain still have it, certain still don't have it. I'm not an expert in, in still, <laughs> okay. but I know that some of them, some don't have, some don't have. Sometimes it's, it's, the wine is being naturally preheated with um, the, the vaporized uh, wine. Sometimes it is not. Um, it's just probably to, 
I don't know if it probably avoids like a really big contrast in temperature by the time instead of having really cold wine going in here it's preheated I'm, I'm not sure what it probably then you know uh, evaporate quicker because it's already yeah, at a higher temperature point yeah it's probably efficiency yeah and, and the other question I, I got from the audience is um, the, this limitation this uh, this capacity uh, limitation you yeah? know uh, mm -hmm. in the in the in the in the in the steel in the capacity yes. of the steel why you think it has to do with in which way it relates to the style or the quality in your experience? Oh, <laughs> that's a very good question. Um, I'm not sure why there is a limit. I would imagine that in terms of controlling, because we'll see afterwards, there are a lot of cuts that are going to be done during the distillation process. Um, it's probably easier to control when you don't have like massive volumes uh, in terms of the different cuts. Why is the law in place? I'm not so sure, to be honest with you. Um, I, I, I don't know what, what, what's the, the true reason of, I mean, that's already quite a lot of liquid if you look at it yeah, yeah. <laughs> to deal with. Um, but I don't know what is the, the, you know, the historical reason or the true reason, or maybe there are no, no still, you know, I don't know, produced, I suppose, in, 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 in whiskey, but in whiskey world, there are massive still. I, I, don't, I don't know. I honestly don't know. And, and the heat is... Uh, you, you told that the heat was uh, it's like a boiler I mean it's, but is uh, is gas so what is heat? so the, the most common is gas nowadays uh, but it has to be by law it has to be contact heat okay fire it has to be direct, directly in contact uh, so usually yes so usually now it's they would do it with the gas um, originally they would have done it with wood or maybe coal I don't know if coal have been used for cognac or not I don't know wood, wood definitely uh, but nowadays it's usually a uh, fire which which is turned uh, which is created with gas not with uh, steam not, not steam okay no no steam no it has to be contact direct heat contact thank you very much direct flame contact so the two different distillations remember premier shaft the first heat the first heat and then the second one the bunch of the cool heat so Typically, the first time, the first, the premier shock is going to be divided in three parts. So, what does I mean by this? When the wine is going to boil and it's going to start to vaporize, and um, at different points in time, by the moment it starts evaporating to the moment there is pretty much nothing less left of that wine in, in, in the vessel, it will reach different uh, points of alcohol. So, it's going to start. Uh, you know, you can be quite low in alcohol, then uh, you have the heart and then you have the hand. But it also has, it carries different components. It carries different aromatic components, um, different, uh, you know, different, I don't know how to say that, but from, from start to finish, you won't have the same in composition exactly in whatever comes out of that, of that steel. And that is why the person, the master distiller, the person in charge of the distillation, knows exactly by obviously doing some analysis and by timing and so on when what to keep what to not keep what to recycle and what is the part that needs to actually goes on for a second distillation so the first part the first liquid that is going to be coming out is called the heads the tets the heads and those are all the time sent back into the charging vessel so move back into the wine to be distilled again then at some point during whatever comes out of that still you reach what is called the brouille and the brouille is typically around 27 to 30 percent alcohol and that is the part which is going to be put aside and which is going to be sent to be distilled a second time and then you've got the last part which are called the tails and the tails as you can see the coup, the tails are gone back into the charging vessels as well and will be distilled again with um, with the next batch of wine. So they're mixed back into wine. So as you can imagine, then it will increase a bit the, the alcohol content of the wine. Um, but that is, that, that, is, that is absolutely fine. You always have some liquid left in the, in the original vessel where the wine is contained. Um, those, this liquid in French is called vina, which is not a very nice word. And this is not good quality anymore. This is a lot of residues and so on. And this is being discarded. So 
only we is kept to move on to the second distillation. The second distillation, which is called the Bonnerschoff, is most of the time divided in four parts and not of th in three parts. So you again have the, the heads, the tets, which again are going to be sent back into, uh, very often sent back into the first distillation, into the, the next batch of wine, often. But, um, you know, the, the, distiller, the distiller at this point has a choice to send them back to the first distillation or keep them and send them back again to the second distillation. So again, and this is very technical, this is not my <laughs> this is not my, my my job or my specialization. It's down to you know the 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 skill and the styles of what the distiller is looking for. So when the heads, the hearts, are, sorry, the heads and the tails are removed, that's that's up to really each of distillation this master distiller to decide where do they want to reuse those those tails and heads. But they are not being wasted. They are being really distilled, maybe in the wine again at the start, or maybe in the brouillis in the second, in the second distillation. Then um, the second is another part. So you've got the heads and you have the hearts that arrive. The heart is what is going to make the future cognac. So that's the spirit, the eau de vie, which is clear, which is being removed, which is being collected, and which is going to be sent for maturation. And then you have the second, the seconds, the, the second seconds in English. And those, you again have the choice to send them back to whether the brouille for the second distillation or to send them back to uh, the wine for again the first distillation. So it's all kind of deciding when to cut, they're called a coupe, the, to cut those different uh, parts of the distillation. This is technical, something I would absolutely not be able to do. <laughs> uh, but that's really what, part of what makes a spirit at the end, a good spirit or not, because it's really an art, it's really a skill, and that's uh, the part of the distiller. And again, you've got uh, some residue left called, again, vinas, which are discarded um, into cognac. Now, there is another product that I don't think I mentioned in the slide, but uh, which is called Esprit de Cognac. I'm not sure if you've heard of Esprit de Cognac. It's not considered as something you will be drinking because it's uh, it's a third distillation of cognac, um, which is always between 80 and 85 percent alcohol, uh, so very very strong. It is not used for consumption as people don't drink it. It actually is used in the production of sparkling wines. So I won't, won't be talking about this, but it is it is allowed. Uh, to really still the third time to produce that specific spirit called Esprit de Cognac, which is not used for the spirit industry, but for the sparkling, the sparkling wine industry. So, yeah, I don't know if you have any questions on, on, on this. It's, I know it's, it's very complicated. Um, you know, you have to remember the heads, the tails, the hearts, the bruit, <laughs> and all of those, of those terms if you're going to pass an exam. Uh, but the first, the, the important thing to remember is the brouille, uh, which is B-R-O-U-I-L-L-I-S, is the part which is kept and sent to the second distillation. And then the heart is the part which is sent for maturation, which is going to become a cognac. You talked about, just to mention, I mean, you, you talked about the Remy Martin uh, method. Yes. And you said that there were terms that were solved later. This is the case, no? Or here oh, the yes, Rémy. yes, yes. So if I go back to that, to that here. Uh, so in Rémy Martin, so the, the, sec, the, sec, the, second, the second that I mentioned are not always recycled. And we met Rémy, with Martel, sorry, they always recycle them. And they always send them back to the wine part. So it's going to go back again to distillation. Uh, when in Rémy Martin, they're only sent back to the brouille, so send back for the second distillation. That's where I said earlier, we didn't mention the second. And knowing that as well, the seconds are not always recycled. So some people decide to not keep the second. So it's, it's done again to a choice. Personally, I don't have the knowledge in distillation and the experience in tasting all of those with a distiller to tell you, you know, why are those seconds sometimes discarded or why they send back to the wine, the wine or what are they send back to the brouille? Um, that is really technical. So I wish I, I could really tell you the details on this, but unfortunately this is like a 
something super technical on that I don't have. I won't spend a lot of time with it, Cecilia. <laughs> Thank you for that. So maturation of cognac. So maturation of cognac, there are a couple of things which are going to be making a big difference in the end results. First of all, the type of oak. So cognac is always matured in oak. It has to spend a minimum of two years in oak cask uh, before it is being released on the market. In general, um, a cask in cognac is around 350 liters. I'm not sure there is a law that says that it can't be anything else, but the average cognac cask is often 350 liters in size. And so it's always, um, it's always oak cask and it's minimum two years. You have two types of cask that can be used uh, coming from two different forests in France. You have the Limousin forest and you have the Troncé forest. And um, those two oaks are actually different. So from the Limousin, you have a type of oak which is called Carcus Robur, which also can be called Pedunculate oak. Okay, well, it's best technical and geeky. But anyway, this is a question that can come up in competition. This type of oak um, tends to be more open grained and it contributes uh, more tannins to a spirit. So obviously when a spirit is being matured, it's going to be very often the first year it's going to spend in new oak, or new, uh, in new oak very often. And then it's going to be moved from uh, other different types of cask. The person in charge of the maturation is going to taste those spirits. Because a spirit which is you know, very fiery, very powerful, very strong, might do quite well in a cask, which are going, is going to contribute more, more tannins, you know, to try to kind of bring the texture, soften the texture, under the texture, you know. Bring. But if you have a very subtle eau de vie, very elegant eau de vie, very perfumed, you might not want to give it the same oak treatment. So you might not want it to be new oak, you might not want it to be in that type of oak. So obviously this all has an, this is all a uh, decision which is made by the person in charge or the people in charge of aging the, the eau de vie, the cognac. Then you have the Cécile oak, which is from the Troncé forest, which has a tighter, which is tighter grain. And that tends to, so less tannic, but also as tend to give more flavors, uh, which has more component called methylo, Mesilotolactone, which I can't pronounce, which tend to give uh, aromas and flavors of coconut. So the Cecilog tend to give more of those flavors. So again, if you have an eau de vie that you want to preserve the flavors, maybe you don't want to send it to that type of oak, or at least not new, because you don't want you know, to hide, I don't know, the perfume, the flowerness the, of, of, some, of some eau de vie, maybe something with more body, more fruit. Uh, you might want to season it with those type of aromas. So it's all down to, uh, you know, to decisions, to uh, man taken decision or women taken decision. I actually don't know how many women now are in charge of measuring, of measuring cognac. So that is one of the one of the part of the maturation of cognac. So minimum two years, always in oak cask. And you have the cask or the, the oak use can come from two forests in France. And those two forests have different type of oaks, which are going to give different, uh, which are going to contribute differently to the eau de vie, to the spirit. So that's actually that mentioning again. Um, so the young spirits are tasted and categorized as coupe. So whatever comes out of the of the of the the, the, the still is called a coupe. Forgot to mention that. And they are, as you can see, so they are analyzed based on their organoleptic uh, characteristics. So that's what I mentioned. I mentioned the new oak versus used oak uh, decision. The other thing which is very important is high humidity cellar versus low humidity cellar. High humidity cellars for some reason, and I was surprised when I was researching on this, seem to be more uh, rare in cognac uh, than low humidity cellar. I would have expected the opposite, but apparently high humidity cellar for some reason seems to be more difficult to manage. What happened is when you have high humidity in the cellar versus low as humidity, um, so high humidity tend to be cooler, low humidity tend to be hotter. That's why they're drier. The way the spirit is going to mature is going to be totally different. 
the evaporation that happens is called the angel shares in cognac, la part des anges. What evaporates in a cask of cognac? Ethanol evaporates, but also water evaporates. So depending on how cool and how warm, how humid and how dry a cellar is, you won't have the same ratio of evaporation between ethanol and water happening. So a high humidity cellar tends to give some cognac which are smoother and rounder, when the low humidity cellar tend to give some cognac which are a bit drier, can be a bit harsher in some way, a little more powerful. So the, the condition of the cellar is going to really have a big impact as well on how the cognac is going to mature. And of course, once the spirits are old, often it's past 50 years old, um, they won't gain anymore from the oak. Uh, in fact, they probably will start, you know, taking too much from the oak. Uh, they might start having too much um, as you, oxidative flavors. It's not the word, rancio flavors is more the term I'm looking for. So uh, at this point, often the very old spirits are going to be moved in demijons, which you can see here at the bottom left, which are uh, glass, like glass jars, massive glass bottles, which are covered in, um, trying to find the word for that. Uh, it's like, yes, it's like a straw. Uh, is it, uh, it's not weak. I don't remember the name of, um, of, of, that, of that plant. But anyway, they're covered, so they're protected from the light with this. But once they are in glass, they are not aging anymore. It's like they are stopped in time. So a cognac, which has been bottled 100 years ago, has been like stopped in time a hundred years ago. If you have kept that cognac, the same cognac in a cask, it will still mature, it will still evolve. So the two side by side won't taste the same. One is stopped in time forever until you finish it, and one will keep its maturation and it will keep evolving. So at some point, very often, the old spirits are moved into the demijohns uh, to just preserve them and to keep them at their peak uh, because the master blender decided that this cognac had reached perfection, this spirit has reached perfection. We put it into a side of the cellar, which often is called the paradis, the paradise, uh, which is where the uh, precious eau de vie are, are being kept. And they can sit there for, you know, for a very, very long time. And they're usually uh, used for the blends in the very super premium spirits and the most expensive cognac that you find on the market. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if you have any questions on, on maturation. In... No, I understand it's an interesting point to, to, to take into consideration that the, the style is also influenced by two decisions over here, or three or four, yeah? Mm -hmm. Yes. And they take really seriously to a different level the maturation in, in comparison to other spirits. Yeah? Yes, absolutely. And um, you see, you, I'm just thinking of the spirits. So I'm thinking about whiskey, for example. Uh, if we go back to really the story, whiskey can be distilled anytime. Uh, the, you know, the the all year round, the the the, the, the malt barley or the barley or, or, or the other cereals can be can come from anywhere most of the time. When the grapes are in cognac, you know, if you like, you have a lot of frost this year. I'm not sure how, how cognac has been doing, but you know, you can lose a harvest. Then it's going to have an impact on how much you're going to produce. Then the distillation has to happen before the 31st of March. That follows that harvest. So then they have lots of that. They have half the year to focus on the maturation in the cellars in cognac. I mean, if you look at how I many Hennessy has, I think, the largest connection of, of casks in the world, I, I, if, I, if I'm not wrong. Um, I think they do. They, I mean, it's the, 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 the market of casks in cognac is, is incredible. Um, it's, 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 it's incredible. So, yes, yeah, so whiskey could be aged, you know, start in a bourbon cask and then be finished in a sherry cask or in a madeira cask or in a port cask, you won't see that in cognac. Cognac is going to remain from beginning to end in cognac casks, whether young or a new cask or a mature cask, but it is not going to happen. You can't mix, you can't mix it with another spirit. And at the same time, the, the way, the decisions that they make with the leaves and the and the way that they steal, and at the end of the day, the, the, the way they keep the, the, 
in a high humidity or low humidity cellar can encourage or can accentuate this, this style in a certain way. I mean, you can go uh, like plus, like uh, adding features in, mm -hmm. in, the, in, the, in the Absolutely. Of doing something Thanks. more drier or more plenty and richer. Yeah? Yeah. Yes. So you can, and then you also have the terroir impact because you always, you can get the grapes coming from different areas within cognac. So you don't, uh, you know, very often if you have grapes coming from Grand and Petit Champagne, you might have them together uh, but, uh, or separately. But if you, you could have grapes coming from Bonbois, uh, from Bois Ordinaire and, I don't know, Borderie maybe, and, you know, blend them together and this will give you a, a difference. So everything, every step in the making from the grapes to the maturation, there are so many steps that are going to make a difference in the end result, in the style at the end. Nice. And the and, and, and the personal taste uh, or style of a, of a specific house as well, what they're looking for. <laughs> so in terms of the labeling and classification, so the counter system the, is, is something to uh, just, you know, important to understand. So distillation has to be finished by the 31st of uh, March following the harvest. So the following day on the 1st of April of every year, after the distillation is officially finished, this is called 1st of April is considered count zero. So you're on date zero. For a cognac to be aged or to be sold, it has to be aged for minimum two years. So from the first, let's say, if the grapes were harvested in September 2019, then the distillation would have to be finished by the 31st of March 2020. So the Conte Zero officially starts on the 1st of April 2020. So Conte One will be on the 1st of April 2021 and Conte Two will be on the 1st of April 2022. So technically a cognac made from grapes harvested in September of 2019 won't be on the market before 2022. It makes sense. So, and that will be, if it's only two years, it will be sold as a VS, so very special, which means very special. And that's like the entry level in terms of age, of aging of cognac. Then you've got VSOP, which means very special old pale, which is a minimum of four years in cask before being released. Then you've got the EXO, which means extra old, um, which was in fact first produced by the house of NOC, I think in 1870, there is a house who who came up with the, 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 the labeling EXO. Um, until recently, it was minimum six years for EXO cognac. But since the last couple of years, it's minimum 10 years. So if you buy a cognac from you know, 10 years ago, it, it could have been technically for six years instead of 10 years, or eight years instead of, of 10 years. But now to be called EXO, it's minimum 10 years. I think you have XXO as well, which is minimum 14 years. Uh, which I've actually never seen one, uh, labeled as so. I've tasted very old cognac, but not labeled as XXO. Um, so that's, you know, the, the, the labeling. Another labeling term that you can find on the label is fine champagne. So if you see fine champagne on the bottle of cognac, it means that it is a blend of cognac, which were uh, distilled from grapes grown in Grand Champagne and Petit Champagne region sub-region with a minimum of 15% coming from the Grand Champagne sub-region. That's, that's what fin uh, champagne uh, means. And then also, you know, always remember, so cognac is often a blend of vintages. Uh, and if you have, uh, if you have a mention of, you know, 15 years on the bottle or so, it will always refer to the age of the youngest eau de vie in the blend. So if you had a mention of, of, of an age on the bottle, you know, cognac 20 years, the, the youngest spirit in the bottle has to be aged for a minimum of 20 years in cask. And then the oldest, I don't know, could be much older, but it's, it's, it's always the, the year of the age of the youngest spirit in the blend if you see a mention of a year. So again, if you see EXO, um, it means that the youngest of the V on the bottle is, is going to be 10 years. But it doesn't mean that there is, you know, some of the V could be 20 or 30 years in the bottle, but the minimum is going to be 10 years old. That's for the, that's for the, for the labeling. 
of cognac. So minimum two years in cask by law. Try to remember the count, which is a bit the confusing part. So finish distillation by law 31st of March, following the harvest. And the following day, which is the 1st of April, it's at zero. A year later, 1st of April, it's at one. And a year later, it's at two on the 1st of April. So that's, that's how it is uh, calculated in terms of aging in maturation and aging in, in cognac. The permitted additives, which we have to mention. <laughs> so when you produce cognac, you are allowed to use in small quantity, in small quantity, certain additives. So sugar in very small quantity can be added. Caramel can be added. Often caramel is used for the color. Um, oak chips can be added. Obviously, um, you know, if you are, it costs money to buy, to buy casks. So if you have um, used casks, uh, are not going to contribute to a lot of oak flavors to your cognac. You can by low add some oak chips into this, so um, it will taste more oaky. I do think, however, that you would taste the difference uh, in a, in a, in any spirit which are, or any wine which have been aged with oak chips in term and which has flavors of oak coming from the chips instead of oak coming from the cask itself. How I tend to describe it and perceive it myself is if, if you think about it making yourself a cup of tea and putting a tea bag into your tea well if you imagine tasting oak that way it tastes infused it doesn't taste like it's part of it, it doesn't taste like it's seasoning it doesn't taste harmonious it tastes like it's been infused with oak and that's that's uh, that can be the case with, with cognac boise is another adjustment that can be done and i actually didn't know about boise until i started <laughs> myself um working in in collaboration with with a cognac uh, cognac brand, and um, the, the funny thing about the Boise is that the person I ended up working with originally, apparently, it was his father or his grand grandfather who had created that technique of Boise, which I didn't realize, and obviously was horrified, if I may say, and did make sure that this was not going to happen in our cognac. <laughs> so what happened is, uh, so you can break up. Um, an oak wood barrel, so probably an old, old, old wood barrel that you don't want to keep, or I'm not sure. You can boil the pieces in the water to create a syrupy reduction, and then you can mix it with some cognac and age that reduction mixed with spirit into an aged barrel. And that way, you create a concentrate of oak flavors um, and also often color because it's being reduced. And this is add, uh, I used to add color and, and flavor. And to be honest with you, it tastes like it's been infused, exactly like oak chips. And it has also the sensation of added sweetness to which I find. Um, so it's my opinion, it's not a very good thing to do. Uh, obviously, it's, be, it's because you're cutting down cost on production um, and you probably want to produce you know, quicker. So you end up managing to make some VS probably, which are going to taste more oaky, more concentrated than they should when they have only spent two years in oak. So that's probably used for the for the entry uh, level, hopefully. Um, I don't I don't think people don't want to talk about that. People don't want to talk about Boise. Uh, they don't want to talk about um, the syrup barrels, which is again, they don't want to tell you what's in it. It's you can use it to add sweetness. It's the kind of ingredients that are tolerated, permitted, but nobody wants to talk about them. Uh, it's uh, kind of the secretive uh, secretive part of the of the cognac world. Then you have the, the faible, which is also called petite zoo, the small waters, which those are um, a, a mix. So it's, it's a cognac uh, which has been aged and which has been also um, diluted with some whether distilled water or demineralized water, because you need to bring down uh, cognac down to 40 percent before you're going to commercialize it and to do this you can't just pour water and just mix it and let's go okay it has to be you know go done on a um by steps um and often faible or petite zoo are used they also already are cognac which are much lower in alcohol which are going to help bringing down the boat the bottling strength so there are the different permitted additives in cognac I don't tell you i told you that don't tell anyone <laughs> So if, if, and maybe you have questions about the previous slide, otherwise I'll, I talk about the industry itself briefly. 
there's no question, but maybe the only one I, I can uh, imagine is all these terms, uh, although they are practices that are used, uh, they are not obliged to put it in anywhere, in any place of the label, and so you will never yes. can tell about that. That absolutely yes. <laughs> that is absolutely true. There is no um, there is no legislation that makes it pr uh, compulsory to to write any of this on the label, and I'll be pretty sure that nobody actually puts it on the label. Um, okay. Yeah, it's it's you can't know. You you really can't know. So the cognac industry, it's, if you're familiar with the champagne industry, it's another thing that cognac has in common with champagne, apart from the name, the two names of the subregions, it's a little bit how the industry is working. So you've got about 78,000 hectares of vines. Most of it is owned by growers. So people are going to grow the grapes, but they're not necessarily going to make wine nor spirit out of those grapes themselves. Some do, but not all of them. In fact, most of those, gra uh, of those grapes are going to be whether processed in cooperative sellers. So cooperative sellers are a lot of growers come together uh, within some premises. Um, there are different ways of doing grapes. Uh, the grapes are going to be fermented and distilled and, and they're going to be sold under you know, different brands. You've got certain cooperative, um, I don't know actually in, in Cognac, but I know that in Champagne, in other, in other region, you can actually of uh, your grapes being processed uh, within the premises and sold under your on your own brands that's another option uh, you can also you could also bring the wine and not necessarily the grapes so only the wine can be brought and be distilled very often um, if the growers are going to make uh, their own wine very often they don't own a, a, a pot still so you've got professional distillers that go around the region at the time you know, when, distillation, when it's time to distill, they have license for distillation and they come and they distill for you. Often it's not, you know, they, it's not in very, very big quantity. Uh, we call them bouilleurs de cru in, in French. Uh, years ago, I mean, I'm talking about the, my grandparents or grand grandparents' time, you always had a bouilleur de cru come in uh, in the village uh, with their still and people would bring their fruits. We bring lots of different things. They would have fermented them beforehand and then they would have brought them for distillation. Now, now it's, it's a little more rare as a profession, especially not in a region where you don't have an appellation like Cognac or Armagnac. And then the main market for the production is going to be the shippers. So the shippers are people who are, um, the people who are going to mature the Cognac. So the distillers often are going to be they collect the grapes, they distill, and they resell to the shippers. Very often, they kind of act as a middleman, so they're going to resell for the shippers who are going to look after the maturation. Now, some shippers also distill some of their, uh, their own uh, wine, so it's, it's not always just the, the, product, the, the distilled product that they receive, but the main four people on the market, the, the main four businesses on the market are Hennessy, which is owned by LVMH, which is the largest producer of cognac in France or in the world, You've got Rémi Martin, which is owned by Rémi Cointreau, Courvoisier, owned by Bim Centauri, and uh, Martel, which is owned by Pernod Ricard. So they are the main uh, four big uh, producers of cognac on the market. And uh, we, call, they, we call them shippers because they mature them, they mature the cognac, then they bottle under their own brand, and then they sell directly to importers or consumers, shops, and so on. And then the ind independent producers, few of them are those growers who are going to grow their grapes, make their wines, distill with or without the help of the professional distillers, and then mature um, those, uh, those spirits themselves and sell them under their own label. And very often in cognac, you would have the word chateau uh, on the label of a producer, which is an independent producer. They're going to use the word chateau very often. So that's how the, the system is, is on, in the industry is built. It's very, very similar to, to cognac, uh, to champagne. Some people grow the grapes, some people process them, some people mature them, some people brand them. So it's, it's very, very similar to, uh, to the champagne industry. Do you have any question for me perhaps or? Not from here, we, but uh, we probably will have for the next part. Yeah, now you will talk about part? your yeah, your own project. <laughs> how I felt, how my own project, how I fell into cognac. <laughs> okay. 
So that's where we're reaching. <laughs> In fact, uh, before I say that, I actually saw, found some very interesting, um, um, very interesting uh, numbers when I was kind of finishing my presentation and so on, which I actually never realized. 95% of cognac produced is sold abroad outside of France, which I never realized. I knew that uh, cognac wasn't necessarily doing very well as a spirit in France, but I actually never realized that 95 of it was export. So a lot of cognac consumed in the world, most of it is actually consumed outside of, of the region of production and outside of the country of production. So that, how did I end up? Um, so the, the project I'm working with is called Exto. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a new brand of cognac, which we launched on the market two years ago now. And how did that happen? So the funny thing is I'm actually from the Armagnac region and not from the Cognac region. So, uh, <laughs> which is, you know, Armagnac and Cognac are a little bit like, uh, which one is the best, which one is the best. Armagnac people will tell you it's Armagnac and, and vice versa. I, uh, I'm not saying any of this. I like both of the spirits, but um, I had the opportunity three years ago, uh, nearly four years ago to start working. I was contacted and it, it is actually a funny story because I was contacted after the world championship in Mendoza, about a year later, I received a message through LinkedIn from a lady called Sabrina Duong, who asked me, who told me that uh, she, a best friend was making some cognac. She grew up uh, in cognac and uh, she had worked, uh, she, she actually worked in the perfume industry for years. And she wanted to start her own project, her own business. And she asked me if I would agree to meet her and have a chat about it because she wanted to create a cognac. I was like, okay, this is quite interesting. Originally, I was wondering, you know, you receive messages sometimes and I was wondering, oh, I, I, I don't know if this is true or not or so on. So I, I went to Paris. I met her in Paris. I met actually with the master distiller. I met with um, one of the, the people in the family who was in contact with all the growers because in fact, they're actually making, they all grew up in, Cham in, in cognac and they're all making cognac from generations. And we started the project. And the idea was, that was to try to create a, a style of cognac, um, which was going to break a little bit the, the perception of cognac with the style to be accessible by more people. We, we wanted it to be enjoyed by younger generation. We wanted it to be enjoyed by women as well, not to be seen as cognac as just you know, a, a men drink. And we wanted as well a packaging which was going to be not what a, a bottle of cognac looks like generally and staying away from um, the, the regular terms, legislation terms that are seen on a bottle of cognac. So that's kind of was where it all started. So that's the three of us here. So in the middle, you have Sabrina. Giro is the person who is the master, the master blender. And uh, so uh, I'm on the right here. That was one of our tasting session in, uh, in Scent, not far from cognac. So how did we do it? Obviously, we are like a micro negociant. We don't own any vineyards. We don't distill what we, we do. We're very lucky. Giro, uh, Giro's family has been making cognac for gener generations. Uh, he has a lot of contacts in the cognac regions. And he has managed to contact within, his, his, uh, within the, the people he's closed with to contact 15 small producers who would allow us to have access to some of the reserves that they've been putting aside over the years. So those people make a little bit of cognac, but they sell many uh, distilled uh, products of some of their grapes to bigger houses. There is a part of those spirits that they want to age for themselves that they put aside and that you know, they don't give away that easily. And we were very lucky because we had access to some of, of, those, um, of those cognacs. So the... the when we started the project, uh, Sabrina asked me, do you know, do you have a mind in what you want to do? Uh, how do you want to do it? Because obviously I'm based in Dublin. I'm not based in Cognac. Uh, traveling, you know, back and forth from Cognac, even from an ecological point of view, is not ideal. So where do we start? So I did go to Cognac a few times, but I also was sent a lot of samples. And the way I wanted to do it is, I mentioned earlier, you can make, you can grow grape, fabulous grapes, I mean, very good grapes from good terroir, and you could grow bad grapes from excellent terroir, it, you know, it's, and you can the same produce some really good wines from, from good grapes, but you can also make very bad wines from good grapes if you don't know what you're doing or if you're making a mistake. So I, I, 
I love blind tastings when I drink wine. I don't, I like not knowing what I'm drinking because I don't like having a pre-perception or being, um, I don't like being influenced by the label. So I love blind tastings, uh, blind tasting wines for this reason. So I decided to do exactly the same with, with the, the samples that were going to be sent to me. I said to Giro, I said, I don't want to know how old is the spirit. I don't want to know where is the spirit coming from in, in cognac. What I want to focus on is I want to focus on the quality of each spirit you are going to send me. So we started by sending me some individual spirits to decide on uh, what was going to be the core of our blend. And at that point, my goal was to try to produce a VSOP or, or so on. But we never produced a VSOP, in fact. We ended up producing, it's not an XO, but it, the younger spirit in the Eau is 10 years old, but it's not labeled as an XO. So, and we ended up producing another one, which is extremely rare. So we ended up producing some, some, old, uh, some older cognac that we had sought originally. So I received a lot of samples, base spirits, and they all said, taste them all and tell me if there is anything that actually talks to you there and that you like to start working with. And within those tastings, there were two spirits that actually stood out. There was one in particular, I'll start with the first one. There was one spirit that for me was incredibly um, aromatic. It really smelled, it reminded me of when I was going to the fun fair as a kid. I, I love, you know, memories of smell and so on. So I remembered, I don't know if you have those apples, uh, they are covered in caramels on a stick that you can buy in, in, fun, in fun fair. And I was never allowed one as a, as a child, but I remember passing by them, the stands and dreaming of tasting them and the smell of them. And this sort of view was incredibly fruit forward like this. And there was something a bit like kind of not sweet because you cannot smell sweetness, but there was something a bit, you know, caramel like about it. And it smelled like really ripe raspberries. And I just, I just said to him, okay, this is definitely one of the eau de vie I want to keep. So we put that one aside. And then another eau de vie that um, was for me the one that I just said, and I, it's one of the best eau de vie I've ever tasted in my life. I tasted it. And we often say, you don't talk about acidity when you talk about spirits. Um, and this, uh, this sort of had energy. And like when I tasted it, I literally had goosebumps all over, all over my arms. It's not, it was like ginger and passion fruits. And it had a lot of rancio character, but it had an energy to it, which was absolutely incredible. So I said, oh, what about this one? And then um, I don't know how he ended up sending me very rare and very old eau de vie which obviously was very expensive and, and he was like oh in fact i made a mistake i shouldn't have sent you this one it obviously doesn't fit within the budget or what you know the type of cognac you want to do but then i managed later on to convince uh, sabrina to produce another another blend of a premium cuvee with that eau de vie because i just thought it was amazing and i'll tell you the story about that eau de vie afterwards because i only find out a year later so that's how we did it so tasting back and forth, sending me back some blend until we were happy with the blend. When I say on this side, it less is more approach. We didn't decide at the start, uh, we're going to blend 25 other V's or 10 other V's. Or I just said, you know, I, I'm more a person who likes single grape varieties in wine. I'm not a person who loves blends. And I think it will reflect, or it did reflect in what we produced with the cognac. We ended up having less than 10 eau de vie blended in each of the cognac because I just said to Giro, that's it. That is, you know, that's what I'm happy with and that's, that's what I, I, I want and that's it. So that's kind of how it, it really worked, uh, the blending process. So I'll show you the two cognac we, we produced. So that's the first one, Elixir. So this one, the core de vie is the one that I mentioned, really reminded me of the funfair and raspberry and violet. And in fact, uh, it's a blend of um, eight eau de vie coming from, from the four different parts of, of cognac, which I didn't know until the lunch date because I arrived in Singapore on the lunch date. And then I realized I went to have questions from journalists and so on. And I actually never, I can talk about what I feel about them and how they taste and so on and what pairings to do. But I ended up never asking them what's the technical that's how about them at the end, you know, because that's not how we made them. So I find out then, day before the lunch, that it's a blend of pretty much 24, 25% of Borderie, uh, Grand Champagne, Petit Champagne, and Fembois. 
that's the four uh, terroirs which are in it. The youngest eau de vie is 10 years old and the oldest eau de vie 35 years old. And the eau de vie, the core de vie that I picked originally was the borderie. And that's why now I say the borderie was the really like the gourmandise, the, the violets, the raspberry and so on. For me, that really was what I find and loved in that eau de vie and that's the core of it. None of the cognac, none of the spirit I picked came from dry cellars. They all came from humid cellar. So all the other are actually very smooth and very soft. Uh, I find them very elegant. They have a purity to them. None of them has been, have been in, in new oak. So that was also my other important thing for me. I didn't want a cognac which, has, which had a lot of oak impact, a lot of oak seasoning. I wanted a cognac that let the, the complexity of the spirit shine. Of course, the oak is important. It brings the seasoning. But like in wine, I just wanted it to be there as a seasoning, not to think about it when you were tasting it. So that's, that's the, the elixir like, so that's, uh, that's, uh, we, we came up for, with. So as you can see, it's a bottle which, is, uh, which doesn't look like a, a cognac bottle. It probably looks more like a bourbon bottle or I don't know, a rum bottle, but it's not, uh, it's, it's, it's not. I don't think cognac has been using that. And we use Vinaloc as a closure for all of our, of our cognacs as well. Um, I remember also somebody being annoyed when you open a bottle of cognac a few times and then suddenly the corks start, start crumbling because you keep it for a while open or it separates from the lead or so on. And I just love the way Vinaloc look. It's pure, it's transparent, and it's how I felt about the style we wanted to produce. So we went for the, the, the closure to kind of follow that, uh, that philosophy. And then that's the other one, the Or Imperial. And so the Or Imperial is um, very limited. And the reason for this is because the eau de vie needs are very old. So the eau de vie that I mentioned when I tasted gave me goosebumps. And I literally was like, I so attracted by this eau de vie. It was like it was calling me. I find out the story about it months later. It was um, a collection of eau de vie that were found about 10 years ago, maximum, by one of the producers. They were rebuilding one of the cellars where they had the maturation of their cask. And when they were looking at the plans of the cellar to, to see what they were going to do, they realized that there was a wall in the cellar that wasn't on the plan. So they were thinking, that's strange. They, why would it not be added on that plan or so on? So they broke the wall and realized that behind the wall, uh, there was some very old uh, semi-john, the mid-john uh, like a vessel, which had been hidden. Uh, and forgotten, which had been hidden by the grand grandfather during the Second World War to protect their best stock from uh, the German invasion in France. Uh, so, those are the V, we've got them dated, but it can't be exact. So, we can only give a range. We know the, the youngest is 50 years old because we've got the paper for those, but uh, the oldest or the V we estimate is around 110 years old in the blend. Obviously, it's, it's a pre super premium uh, spirit in terms of, of quality, in terms of price point. Because once those 800 and so bottles are gone, it's history which is gone. You know, there is none left of those. Uh, so the style is different. It's not as rounded, it's not as opulent and smooth as the other one. It's more kind of sleek and lean with a very impressive, what I think, core, core energy, which uh, was what attracted me to that original eau de vie and the aromatic are uh, more rancio but you also have um I, I really find a lot of like lime citrus peels and passion fruit in this and quite a lot of sea salt also in this eau de vie but i suppose you know it's personal and it's really what you what you find when you taste it and um and we always serve them in uh, this riddle glass, uh, not for the brand, but we just like the fact that, again, it's not the traditional cognac glass. It's a more elegant glass. Uh, we use this for all of our cognac, a stemmed, a stemmed glass, uh, which looks more like a wine glass uh, to kind of try to bring people to consume cognac in a different way. So that's, um, that's for the story of, of X2 and how it started. And um, yeah, and it's been a fascinating uh, journey. <laughs> and on this yeah. bottle there, the top is actually, um, it's a glass top and it's uh, done by hand. It's blown 
by two French artists. So each piece is, uh, is unique because the, the color, everything is done uh, by hand. Thank you. Thank you, Julie, for the story. It's a nice story to remember. I mean, and talking about uh, pairing or the way you consume, uh, you, you suggest each, each one of them. Do, do you have any impression over there to share with us? So, uh, yes, because we, we launched originally in Singapore, we've done a lot of uh, pairing with uh, Asian food. And we've done it served different ways. So um, we, did, we did a lot of pairing with the elixir. Your Imperial, we, we haven't done pairings. We, we recommend to drink it, you know, on its own as like after dinner or just, you know, for something very special. But for the elixir, we've done actually quite a lot of food and wine pairings. So, for example, um, we just add a small ice cube just to bring down the, the temperature a tiny bit for starters, for example. And one of the best pairings we had with it was with uh, sea urchin. Sea urchin uh, with the version that was served with just a tiny bit of ice cream to just bring a tiny bit of dilution and cool down the temperature was absolutely beautiful. Um, then we done uh, some pairings with... Um, Peking duck, the, 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 the crispy uh, skin of Peking duck, this time with the neat version or just with a drop of water, again, just to open up a little more the aromas and, and tame down a little bit the alcohol, you know, impression. Um, we've done some pairing with um, pork belly, so which would have been cooked for, slow cooked for a very long time, served with some uh, Chinese five star, star anise, uh, very, very good. Dessert wise, it's more challenging because uh, we find that in fact that dark chocolate doesn't work with this cognac. Chocolate can work very, very well with cognac, but it doesn't work with elixir. However, we find that um, raspberry, raspberry macaroon or raspberry based dessert was one of the flavors and, and that really worked the best with it. What other, what I'm trying to think, what other pairings did we, um, did we do? Foie gras is very nice. If you have a piece of pan fried foie gras, it's it's really beautiful with it. Um, but again, temperature wise, I will be I will be careful not to serve it at too warm temperature. So if room temperature is at 28, it's too warm. I would say nearly at a cellar, cellar temperature, you know, 12, 13 degrees uh, would be really ideal. Then you can you know, warm up a little bit in your glass and so on. But I wouldn't serve it at what we call room temperature normally because you get the fumes, it's losing like most spirits, it's losing its focus and you have more kind of a volatile impression. So with pairing, temperature is going to be important. Adding a bit of water or sometimes even cooling down and diluting a little bit with a small ice cube. Nice. And you, you have a lot of experience in Asia no? as, a, as a market. How, how was the acceptance? I believe good because of the category and everything, but I would like yes. to... Yes, I have to say, um, so we're only in Singapore and in Ireland as well. Uh, COVID has slowed down a little bit while we were to do. Sabrina is based in Los Angeles, so uh, we could start working with in the US very soon, I think. Um, but in Asia, I have to say, I mean, I was so surprised by people were very open-minded. We tried as well, we worked with some mixologists because obviously we need to look at the cocktail side as well. Uh, we wanted to be respectful of the, of, of the product, but I have to say we worked some very, very good mixologists that suggested some very interesting cocktails that really worked with, you know, um, amplifying some of the aromas in the cognac. So we've done cocktails, we've done food pairings. I think in Asia, especially people are used to drink spirits um, as well as wine, but people tend to, you know, to drink spirits. So it was actually very well received and it, it is working very well, selling very well. And we, we have some really good feedback. I have some very, very happy and looking forward to going back uh, to do a little bit of work there. <laughs> okay, I, I, there's a few questions, but I don't wanna, I, I maybe related to your, I will, Sum them all in, in this in your practice in your sommelier practice related to 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 the, the spirit. How you any suggestion? This is the way we started this conversation, but maybe talking about uh, the the practice of a sommelier. How you how you suggest to introduce this type of menus or something like that. So type of menus that's a complicated thing. I suppose it depends which restaurants you are you are working in. And how open-minded, you know, or in pairings you can do and, and so on. 
suggesting with pairings, if you have the ability to taste the food with the chef, um, sometimes I find educating the chef is a good way to start. <laughs> if you actually really, uh, some chefs are educated and love wines and love spirits and so on, but some chefs may be low less or so on. If you really manage to work with the chef and really introduce them to uh, the pairings itself, then that's how I find some often in restaurants, you manage to improve your work on pairings and menus and, and so on. I would never force a spirit on a customer because, you know, I wouldn't say, oh, we have a tasting menu, surprise tasting menu, and bring a spirit without maybe telling people because obviously it's, you know, it's a big step. Some people will tell you they don't drink spirit and so on. But you could have maybe within your menu, if you have suggestions of pairings, you could have maybe a, a wine or a spirit and explain why you recommend it and explain how it is served and do it maybe on one of the dishes. But if you do it, make sure that you know that it is working perfectly and that you're serving it at the, the right way in the right glass way because that is your chance to impress somebody or to, to, to convince them that they really don't like spirits. So I think if you have the right pairing and, um, and you serve it the right way, it's, it could be a good thing. But I would always, whether suggested and be straight with the customer or mention it on the menu, don't surprise somebody with the spirits in the middle in the, with the main course, because you know, that might not be something they are familiar with. Very good. So thank you for the suggestion. I mean, um, well, thank you very much, Julie. Thank you very thank much. You're very for welcome. It was, it was, it was very, a pleasure. <laughs> very educative and at the same time encouraging. Yeah, I hope we, you, you can, we can, we can continue on this path. Yeah, of spirits that are very interesting for the for our pro profession as well. So, thank you. Absolutely. <laughs> I really enjoy the, 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 these two hours. So, thank you very much. Thank you very, very much. <laughs> so